Welcome you all to the ICTP colloquium. We will be um, given by Nicholas Katz. Um, I've known him since 1990. Uh, he works in algebraic geometry and number theory, particularly in on periodic methods. He received his PhD in 1966 from Princeton University and uh, the direction of Bernard Dork, and has been in Princeton ever since, uh, now as a professor. He was a Guggenheim Fellow in 1975, 1987, a member of the, he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences since 2003, a member of the National Academy of Sciences in 2004, and received jointly with Peter Sarnak the Levy L. Conant AMS Prize in 2003. He's an author of over 100 papers, totaling about 2,500 citations in MathSciNet, and also wrote a remarkable string of seven books in the prestigious series Annals of Mathematics Studies published by University, Princeton University Press. He played an important role as sounding board for Andrew Wiles when Wiles was working on his proof of Hermatlas theorem and with Peter Sarnak and others contributed significantly to the study of the connection between the eigenvalue distribution of random matrices and the zeros of L functions. Uh, this was summarized in the book they jo uh, wrote jointly, Random Matrices for Venus Eigenvalues and Monodromy of 1998. And it's fair to say that this book changed, among other things, the way people talk about L functions uh, if you hear an analytic number theorist mention the word GUE or orthogonal symmetries, uh, most likely that is uh, due to the work of uh, Katz and Sarnak. So for, without further ado, let's uh, hear um, life over finite fields. Okay, it's a great honor to be here. Um, so the title, Life Over Finite Fields, Before and After Deline, and we'll start before, whoops, nothing happened there. Okay, so um, the finite, the basic finite field we have in mind is Z mod P, P a prime, denoted F sub P, if the field has cardinality Q, it's F sub Q. And um, okay, so it's the very early history. Fermat understands when minus one is or is not a square mod p. Um, but it's almost 100 years later um, before there's an analysis of when some number a is a square mod p or not. And this is Euler. Um, then we have Legendre, who formulates quadratic reciprocity and at various times in his life is convinced he's proven it, but never quite right. Um, Gauss does prove it. Um, what's relevant here in terms of the, the finite field business is Gauss writes down the formula for how many mod p points there are on this so-called Lemniscate gate curve, um, which also was studied by other people, including Abel. Um, if you want to see what these people look like, here's Fermat, Euler. Um, I forgot where I'm up to. Who's this? This is Legendre, I guess. Gauss. And, um, okay. And Abel. Okay, now Galois, in 1830, um, he's the first person to understand that Z mod P, the, the finite field FP, has an extension field of every degree. So Q can be any power of P. And um, at least in the, in the, English language literature, these were called Galois imaginaries, these elements of bigger finite fields. And that, you can still find that terminology even through the early 20th century, strangely enough. Um, okay, so that's Galois. And in 1835, we have um, Libri, who um, counts the number of mod p points on both of these equations. Uh, Libri as his name suggests, had an interest in books. This interest had a criminal aspect. I mean, he, he somehow got himself appointed the um, inspector general of French libraries. And um, 
stole literally thousands of valuable books from these libraries and fled to England with them. And meanwhile, he was having bitter fights with Leoville. He, Libri, had gotten himself appointed a professor at Collège de France. Um, and for instance, it was a big political problem at Collège de France whether to declare his chair vacant after he had fled to England and had been indicted for theft. <laughs> OK, so um, here's Galois, and here's a, a, an alleged picture of Libri. All right, now we come to the, the sort of more modern era where, um, what? There's a question. Well, so a field is a commutative ring where every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. Okay, like, like real numbers, rational numbers, but also Z mod P if P is a prime. Okay? But there are other fields, in other words, things satisfying these axioms, that also have finitely many elements. And if a field has finitely many elements, um, then when you add one to itself a bunch of times, you're eventually going to get zero, because otherwise it would have infinitely many elements. And the first time that happens, is going to be a prime number p. And then this finite field contains the field z mod p. And if it's finite, it's going to be a finite degree extension. And in fact, there's a finite field of any cardinality, which is a power of p. There's one and only one extension field of degree n, n-dimensional vector space over fp that's a field. And that's what we're talking about. OK, but I'm happy to be interrupted. OK, so um, it already starts before the 1920s. Um, there's this awareness um, of some analogy between the study of number fields and the study of curves over finite fields. But it's only first really made explicit by Emil Artin, who um, def defines the notion of the zeta function of a curve, which he thought, saw as analogous to um, the Riemann zeta function for Q, or the Dedekind zeta function of a number field, and um, formulates the Riemann hypothesis for it. I'll explain in a minute more precisely. Um, and barely seven years later, F.K. Schmidt analyzes exactly what the shape of this zeta function is in general. Here's a picture of Artin. Here's a picture of Schmidt. And now um, let me tell you about this zeta function notion. So let me first start in general. If I have. Okay, so if, if you like it better, you can take this, you can take Q to be P. Right? So this is supposed to be some algebraic variety. So it's defined by finitely many equations with coefficients in this field in finitely many variables. And maybe it's just affine equations. Maybe you think it's in projective space, defined by homogeneous equations. Um, and as I was saying a minute ago, this finite field, here's of Q, but for every n, there's a field extension. So this, this thing, if you think of it as a vector space, it's an n-dimensional vector space over this guy. There's one and only one. And in, um, this is not the way Artin originally did it, but what we want to look at is the number of solutions of these equations in these extension fields for every n. And 
You might think that you should just make a generating series where this is the nth coefficient. But it turns out that the, the better way to do it, say, well, OK, theta of x, it's going to be a function of a variable t. And it's, going to, it's initially going to be a power series, n greater than or equal to 1. This number of points over the extension of degree n. And then you multiply by t to the n over n. So it's not obvious a priori, but this turns out to be the good way to package this data. OK. So a priori, this is um, a power series with rational coefficients and constant term 1. Okay? Already, what's not completely not obvious at all, unless you rewrite this as some sort of Euler product, is that in fact it has integer as a power series. It actually has integer coefficients. Okay. Now, if this x over f q is a um, say projective non-singular geometrically connected, I'm not going to keep saying these fancy words, curve. So to fix ideas, it might be, um, so an example, um, x to the d plus y to the d plus z to the d equals 0, thought of projectively um, in any characteristic p that doesn't divide d. That's a wonderful example of what we're talking about, OK? So you take this, and this zeta function, this is what FK, so Martin defines this. And what FK Schmidt proves is that this zeta function, in this curve case, has a very simple shape. It's a rational function. The bottom is 1 minus t times 1 minus qt. The top is a polynomial of degree 2g. G is the genus of this curve. And certainly, if I write down a nice equation like this, the genus is, in fact, the genus of the complex curve defined by this. So for example, here, in this example, the genus would be d minus 1 times d minus 2 over 2. Anyway. So it's a polynomial of degree 2g. And so F.K. Schmidt proves that it looks like this. And this polynomial, we write as a product. It has constant term 1. Um, it has integer coefficients. It has constant term 1. And if we write it in terms of what are called reciprocal roots, these alpha i, then um, he also proves, F.K. Schmidt proves, that alpha to q over alpha um, is an involution of these roots. So it's a kind of functional equation. Um, it is a functional equation for this zeta function. Um, an involution of these reciprocal roots of this piece of 2G. OK, now this Riemann hypothesis is the statement that all these alpha i's should have absolute value the square root of q. Right, now, so. In Artin's thesis, he defines the zeta function quite generally, but he only computes it in a few examples. He formulates the Riemann hypothesis pretty generally. He computes in a few examples and verifies. Now, the question of why we care, or why anybody cared at the time, and for a long time, this was sort of all through the 20s, this was kind of um, 
abstract stuff. And nobody had applications for it. But meanwhile, the English school, independently, um, the English school was interested in, so to speak, the input data to the zeta function. And they were interested in the number of mod p points on some x. They, they, they only had, they would write down, say, this kind of equation. Um, and they wanted to know how many mod p points it had. Now, Mordell, as far as I can tell, was just interested in this question um, just because he thought it was a nice question. Davenport was his student, and Davenport got interested, and I'll explain how in a second. Davenport got interested in the following question. Suppose I'm looking at integers mod p. And I ask myself, um, if I know, for instance, that um, some number, if, if I know that 7 is a square mod p, what are the chances that 8 is also? OK? Or if I know that 7 and 8 are both squares, what are the chances that 9 is? All right? So the general question is, if I take a bunch of offsets, which might be the numbers 1, 2, 3, up to k, and I, I ask, how often will it be the case that I'll have a number and it and all its offsets are simultaneously squares? Okay? And so what you would expect is that if, if you want um, Yes, how, how likely is it that n plus a1 and n plus a2 and n plus ak are all squares? Well, you would think that the chance for each is, is a half. So if, if it's, let's say, 3, 3, x plus a1, x plus a2, x plus a3, you would think that about 1 out of 8 x's would have that property. Okay? And, and in general, if, if you do it with k things, you would expect it's 1 over 2 to the k x's out of your possible range of x's would have this property. And you ask yourself, OK, what is the actual difference between the actual fraction I'll have if I do this with a large prime and the answer I expect, 1 over 2 to the k? Right? Now, a, a, a strange fact, which I only learned um, by maybe wasting too much time reading history articles, was that this problem was considered, I think maybe for k equals 3, by the topologist Heinz Hopf. And he got an error term of p divided by the square root of 6. That's a little bit less than p. And this got Davenport's attention. And right away, he could do better than that. And so the general game with these, with, so, but what it amounted to was that for these curves, if you go through the analysis, you want to know that the number of points on this curve, it's p plus an error term. And what you'd like is, well, ideally, you'd like the error term to be of size the square root of p. Now, what these people like Davenport and Mordell did with particular values of k or particular degrees in this equation with n and m is they got estimates p plus big O. They might get p to the 3 quarters or p to the 2 thirds or at various results of this type. And um, 
Hasa, that's a young Davenport. That's a not so young Mordell. Um, Davenport was um, actually sent to Germany. Hasse was pals with Mordell, and he asked Mordell to send him a young English student who would help him, Hasse, improve his English. So Hasse sent him Davenport. Um, and for a few years, there was this ongoing teasing where um, Mordell and Davenport kept trying to reduce this exponent. And um, Hasse would tease them and say, well, have you reduced any exponents lately? And finally, as far as I can tell, Davenport got sort of tired of this. And he said, well, if you're such a big time conceptual guy, why don't you do something about it? And six months after that, Hasse proved the Riemann hypothesis for elliptic curves. <laughs> Now, let me explain what, what it has to do here. Um, so look at this formula for the definition of zeta, and look at this concrete expression. Okay? Then what this concrete expression says is that in this curve case, the number of FQ points is Q plus one minus the sum of these alphas, the sum of these reciprocal roots. Okay? And not only that, if I ask how many points there are over this extension field, the answer is q to the n plus one minus the sum of the nth powers of these same numbers. Okay? In particular, let's just do the simplest thing where the c of fp so it's p plus 1 minus the sum of these alphas from 1 to 2g. So if you would know that these alphas have size root p, if you know this, then you certainly get that the number of points is p plus 1 plus an error term. And this error in absolute value is at most... 2g root p, because that's how many numbers you're adding up of this size. Okay. So the Riemann hypothesis, if you would know, it gives you this control. Now, again, historically, it's interesting, because it seems part of our sort of early education. Um, but it actually took a while. It wasn't until the early 30s that it was realized that this Riemann hypothesis for this Artin zeta function of a curve actually gave you this kind of control over the number of points. OK. All right, so here's Artin with Hasse over his shoulder. Um, OK, the next thing that happens in 1948, Andre Vey proves the Riemann hypothesis for curves of any genus. And here's a picture of a very young Andre Vey. And at least as important, well, I shouldn't say that, um, is that the, the very next year, they formulate these, what everyone agrees, are called the Vey conjectures, unlike some other things that had a certain life of being called the Vey conjectures, but then the, uh, that changed big time. Anyway, so what, what um, oh, I shouldn't have erased the zeta function. So a minute ago, 
we talked about what the zeta function of a curve looked like as F.K. Schmidt proved that it had a certain form. Now, for this general thing, we take an x over F.Q., which is projective and non-singular and some dimension now n and geometrically connected. Okay. And so you make its zeta function. And now it's supposed to, again, be a rational function. But now there's a lot of terms. There's numerator is a product of polynomials with odd indices, p1, p3, up to p, 2n minus 1. And downstairs, p0, p2, up to p, 2n. Okay. So in the curve case, there's only a p0 and a p2. And downstairs and upstairs, a p1. So it's supposed to look like this. These, um, this guy is going to be 1 minus t. This guy is going to be 1 minus q to the nt. And that exhausts our knowledge of a priori formulas for what these pi's are. Um, each pi is supposed to be an integer polynomial with constant term 1. You're supposed to write it then as a product 1 minus t alpha j, I don't know, j i, something, um, product over some j's. j runs fr from 1 to the degree of p i. Okay. And um, so it's a precise form of rationality that it has this particular form with these integer polynomials. Um, of course, I haven't said very much yet. Um, this duality statement is the statement that now alpha sent to q to the n over alpha interchanges the roots of a pi and the roots of a p 2n minus i. So in the curve case, it's just p1 with itself and the p0 against the p2. Okay. In general, this already says something that's not obvious from what's written before, namely that these two polynomials, pi and p sub 2n minus i, better have the same degree. Okay. And the, um, this compatibility with the complex situation, what that means is the following. Suppose I start with an x, so to speak, over the integers. In other words, it's defined by, say, polynomials with integer coefficients. Okay? And when I reduce mod p, everything is nice, and I get my nice variety x that I was looking at. Okay? So if in this situation, I think of, if I think of the same equations but with complex coefficients, and I take the set of complex points, this is now, I can think of, as a complex manifold. And as a complex manifold, in particular as a usual topological space, it has usual Betty numbers. Okay. And this compatibility is the statement that the degree of p sub i is the ith Betty number of this complex analytic manifold that you get by looking complexically. Okay. And the final statement, the final part of this um, these Bay conjectures is this Riemann hypothesis part is a statement that so these are the reciprocal roots from pi yeah that these are supposed to have absolute value root q to the power i okay 
So, um, this certainly for, for um, the period from, from when these conjectures are formulated in 1949 for the um, 24 years until they were completely proven by Deline, um, for a significant portion of people on Earth who were interested in algebraic geometry, this, this was sort of it in terms of what, what you people dreamed of making some contribution to. And um, I've lost the clicker. This is very serious. Huh. Um. <laughs> Ah, okay. And the situation is kind of stable until the early 1960s, although already in, in 1958 at the Edinburgh International Congress, Grotendieck gives a talk where basically in, in, in one page, which is just part of a long talk, he says... Um, he has these ideas about developing a cohomology theory that's uh, a combination of topological cohomology and Galois cohomology, and he thinks it's going to solve the Bay conjectures. It's, it's just, it's quite remarkable. Um, anyway, in this period of early 1960s, Grotendieck and a whole group of people, but primarily among them Mike Artin, develop um, a lot of cohomology. Here's, here's a young Grotendieck and young Mike Artin. And this l cohomology business, it, um, it has ordinary cohomology, it has compact cohomology. Any statement you know from a topology course about the behavior of these things works in this theory. And it's, it's defined for, say, algebraic varieties over, say, algebraically closed fields of any characteristic. There's actually, it's a little bit tricky because um, if you're in characteristic P, you have to use what's called the L-adic theory. And you have to take the prime, L as a prime, but it shouldn't be P. And the coefficients in this L-adic theory are something like QL, the L-adic completion of Q. So, but let's leave that, let's leave that to the side. Um, now, the compatibility statement here is the following, that if you look at HI in this Eladic theory of an X that came this way, there's this wonderful compatibility that you also could look at the, so to speak, topological cohomology of this thing that I called this complex manifold, where you would take, say, with Q coefficients and tensor over Q with QL. You extend the scalars from Q to QL, but usual cohomology. Okay? So that's nice. It's a, it's a nice check that this theory is constructing something that when you're over the complex numbers is basically what you already had, except that you've extended scalars from Q to l numbers. Okay, now let me say a few words about what um, what all these things are up on the blackboard. So,
This new feature is this. When I have my x over fq, and I look at hi or hi compact, the Galois group of fq bar over fq acts on this. And in this Galois group, there's a canonical generator, which for technical reasons is the inverse of the one that you're taught in number theory. But anyway, there's this canonical generator. And this thing that I'm calling the Lefschetz trace formula because it's inspired by that, although I didn't put a picture of Lefschetz in here, sadly. Um, it's the following statement. Now, for any x over fq, doesn't have to be projective, doesn't have to be smooth, anything, okay? If I want to count the points, that's the alternating sum of the traces of Frobenius sub Q on this HI compact. And if I want to put FQN here instead of FQ, I have to take the Frobenius with respect to Q to the N, which is the nth power of this guy. Okay. So that's the Lefschetz trace formula. And I have to explain just for a second uh, this notion of a local system. So so in usual topology, there this notion which was invented by Steenrod in the 1940s of a local coefficient system. So imagine you have a complex manifold. I mean, the usual example that we might know about this, you have a complex manifold and some nice system of differential equations. And at every point, it has an n-dimensional solution space. And you can do analytic continuation to move solutions near here to solutions near there. Um, so if we have um, a morphism, and let's say that, that this, well, um, for our application, I only need that this is a scheme where the prime L is invertible, and use L out of cohomology. And if this is, say, proper and smooth, projective and smooth, then let's call it F. We have these compact cohomology, well, cohomology along the fibers with these QL coefficients. Okay. And this thing is a local system in this generalized sense, which I'm not going to define on my S. Right? But just like with the traditional local system, if you take two different points of the space that carries this local system, the space should be connected. Um, then, so in, in classical case, if you take a path from this point to this point, you can take guys here and move them and get an isomorphism with guys here. Now, in this picture, and that's going to be true here also, that if you take what this is at one point or what this is at some other point, they agree in some non-canonical way. All right? So if I take this guy to itself be something like z or z with a whole lot of primes inverted, okay? but maybe p is, is, is still good, so I can go from here to fp, or I can embed this into the complex numbers. So if I had started with the thing I called bold x before, when I look at the fiber here, I'm talking about my x over the finite field. And when I'm looking here, I'm talking about 
my x of c of c. And we're talking about the, the hi of these guys. And so here, hi of this complex variety is the same as hi of this variety over a finite field. It's that um, local system business, which is how you see this compatibility of the theory with what's happening over the complex numbers. OK. So um, right. So there's also a, um, a left shed's trace formula for these local systems, which I won't go into. And um, here's Steenrod. OK, now let me explain why, with just what I've told you so far, it almost proves three quarters of the bay conjectures. So I told you there was a Lefschetz trace formula. That's here. Okay? And what that means is that you'll get a description here of zeta if you put p sub i to be the determinant of 1 minus t times Frobenius on h sub i. And because I'm talking about projective things, I can put h sub i or h sub i compact. It doesn't matter. Okay? If you do this, then by the miracle of the formula for the logarithm, you've recreated the zeta function. Okay? And by this compatibility about um, the Betty numbers being the same, and this, these Frobenii are automorphisms, the degree of this polynomial is the ith Betty number if there would be a complex guy floating around. Okay? So it's rational. It has, the polynomials have the right degree. And this um, statement, which has briefly disappeared, about alpha goes to q to the n over alpha, that, in this theory, just becomes, or just results from, Poincaré duality for, in this cohomology theory, okay, which relates an hi and an h2n minus i. So, now I said almost. So, what's the matter? What, what, what's wrong? So, what's wrong is that I said, if we're, suppose we're in, we're in characteristic 691, okay? So, I could, I could use two attic cohomology. I could use three attic cohomology. I could use 1789 attic cohomology, all right? And every time I do, I get a factorization of the zeta function. Let's even suppose that my variety, so to speak, started nicely over the complex numbers. All right? So I get a, a factorization of the zeta function into these polynomials of these degrees that I like. But they're L-adic polynomials. Right? The whole zeta function, is, so to speak, has integer coefficients. But maybe um, when I do different Ls, I get different factorizations. Maybe none of these, these factorizations, um, for instance, I mean, if, if, if when I use the two attic theory and I somehow knew that these polynomials had integer coefficients, and I knew that in the three attic theory they also had integer coefficients, I could at least meaningfully ask, are they the same polynomials? But if I don't even know that, boy, does it not make sense. And then, Forget that. Suppose I stick to, say, the two-attic theory. So then these reciprocal roots, these alphas, in the Riemann hypothesis, which has now disappeared, these reciprocal roots are supposed to have a certain absolute value. But they're not complex numbers. They're two-attic numbers. So what sense does it even make? OK. So Lean cuts the Gordian knot. And here's a picture. And um, let me just say it very briefly. Um, what he does, how he cuts the Gordian knot. And it's, it's really, um, I think it's really an apt analogy. Because, I mean, this Gordian knot, you know, people for 
hundreds of years have been trying to untie it. And they weren't getting anywhere. And Alexander just comes along and goes, whoop. So what does Deline say? Deline says, so he's going to, we have this l theory, yeah? And what's your problem? Your problem, so you have the l numbers and these alphas, these reciprocal roots. There may be an, an algebraic closure of QL bar. Yeah? And we, we're somehow supposed to talk about complex numbers. So Deline just says, OK, pick a field embedding, which he calls iota, of QL bar into the complex numbers. If you believe the axiom of choice, you can do it. Their fields are the same cardinality, and the same characteristic. OK, just do it. All right, and then if we go back to our local system, he's going to say that a local system, script f on, on this scheme s that we were looking at before, is going to say that it's iota pure of some weight w. If the following thing happens, every time you take a finite field, and every time you take a point of S with values in that finite field, okay, you have a Frobenius sub S comma FQ. And it acts on this, in this local system. All right. And you ask that its eigenvalues, eigenvalues via iota have absolute value, the square root of q to the power w. Okay. So it looks. Like, OK, I mean, you can make this definition, but my god, how could you ever prove anything about this? Right. So you can make an observation. You could say, well, if my local system is the constant chief, so the Frobenius just acts trivially. There's one eigenvalue, and it's 1. And the number 1, that's going to have absolute value 1, q to the 0, root q to the 0. So it at least applies to the constant chief. The constant chief is iota pure of weight 0 whatever iota you pick, in fact. OK. And um, the amazing theorem that Deline proves, and this I'm just going to state without any um, even attempt at explanation, is that so now I have a local system f on S, f over fq, which is supposed to be iota pure of some way w. Okay. And I look at the compact cohomology groups of S with this coefficients in f, compact cohomology. Frobenius operates on this. And I look at the absolute value of any eigenvalue of this action on this space. And what the lean proves is that you have an inequality. This is at most root q to the w plus i. i, the cohomology index, w, the weight of the input f. Okay. Now, when you apply this to the constant chief, it says that the eigenvalues when hi compact have weight less than or equal to i. Um, but if that's true in this, for the projective smooth guys, if it's true for the eigenvalues in hi and also in h2n minus i, you have these two inequalities. So they both have to be equalities because of this alpha to q to the n over alpha. So that's how he proves the Riemann hypothesis for projective smooth varieties, but as a consequence of something much stronger, which turns out to have zillions and zillions 
of applications. So, um, so I mention um, that, as Deleen says, it's inspired by reading Rankin's paper where um, he gets, Rankin gets in the late 1930s what were at the time the best known estimates for the size of Ramanujan tau function. And uh, so here's a picture of Rankin, kind of blurry. That's a picture of Sophus Lee, because Lee groups also come into this in a big way. And um, okay, so this is the theorem I was just stating. And um, as I say, there are zillions of applications, a few are written down here. Um, There are lots of applications in number theory. Um, so in my remaining, um, I don't know if I have three minutes or eight minutes. Eight? OK. In my remaining eight minutes, I'll show you um, a baby application already of the classical, I mean, the 1948 type of they bound. Okay, so just coming from Riemann hypothesis for curves, the fact that this bound that I'm going to tell you um, results from the Riemann hypothesis for curves. This was already pointed out in an article by Davenport and Hasse in the 1930s, that if you knew Riemann hypothesis for certain cleverly chosen curves, you would get the kind of estimate I'm going to state. And of course, so here it is. Um, it's about an additive character sum. So you take some polynomial of some degree, and um, you look at e to the 2 pi i, f of t over p. So it's a sum of p roots of unity. Okay? And um, since, so there are p terms in the sum. Okay, each term is a pth root of unity, so each term has absolute value 1. So the trivial bound for this sum is p. But the, the, the they bound is that it's in fact at most d minus 1, the degree minus 1, times root p. Okay? Now, if you apply this in a clever way that I'm not going to go into, um, you get the following kind of statement that if you take a polynomial function that's of degree two or more, and you plot its graph as a function from fp to fp, then, so you do this for each p. So the graph is a little picture, a yeah, bunch of dots. Um, you, you scale it so that instead of being in a box of size p, you shrink it down to be in a box of size 1. Okay. And then the statement is that as p get lar gets larger and larger, these collections of points in the box are equidistributed for usual measure on the box, which you should think of as really the product of two circles. So let me, make, let me show you. So this is, a, this is a graph of the fourth power function, the Archimedean fourth power function. Right. And the next one is, um, God, I think I was a bad boy and didn't write down. Um, this is for a, a not, not a humongously large prime, the graph of the fourth power function as a function from fp to fp. And if you look at it, it, it kind of looks like some sort of um, Indian karmic art. There, there's sort of patterns in there. And um, if we take p a little bit bigger, then it um, looks a little more like that. And then, you know, it's, it's kind of neat looking. So you can make these pretty pictures. And you get, in the unit square, as p grows, you get sets of p points in the unit square that become equidistributed for Haar measure. OK, so that's kind of a cute thing. Now. Um, let me end, because I, I promised to talk about things we don't know as well. Let me end with um, 
Another, another example, which right now it's, what I'm going to say is only empirical. There's no, there's no actual theorem behind it. So in this Weibound, bound you have the polynomial of degree d, and the Weibound bound is d minus 1 root p. The trivial bound is p. Okay? So it's not a very good bound unless d is itself less than root p. Otherwise, you should use the trivial bound instead. Okay? So because of some work of Zanye, I looked at the following polynomial. So I take x, x minus 1, x minus, I call it t there, but it's really, secretly it's lambda. I mean, it's, uh, you raise it to the uh, p minus 1 over 2 power, and you look at the coefficient of x to the p minus 2. That's some polynomial in t whose degree is p minus 1 over 2. It's a humongous polynomial. OK. So the Weibound bound is like a complete disaster, because it would be something like p halves times root p, which is way worse than just the trivial bound of p. Okay. Nonetheless, it seems that this sum is bounded not quite by a constant times root p, but maybe the square root of 2 log p in front. Um, now, I have to confess that, um, so I have some, heuristic based on a model, which, of course, I have no idea if it actually applies. I mean, as I say, there are no theorems here, which leads to this square root of 2 log p. Okay. On the other hand, when I've, I've done um, sort of ra randomly picked some large primes, the biggest around 100,000, and in fact, it always seems to work with, instead of this funny, const funny thing in front of root p, it seems to already work with 4. But I don't believe that's really right. I believe that if I computed more, I would get cases where, where um, we would start to see that something like this is sort of the right answer. Um, so it's a ch I leave it as a challenge to the um, high precision guys in the audience <laughs> to do some experiments. Um, because when I do it, it takes a long time to compute these things. Um, and in fact, when I do it, I say to myself, well, maybe um, so if I think of this as a number in, in the cyclotomic field, Q joins A to P, um, if I would take a different additive character, it, would, it means I would in front of the f of t, I would put a non-zero number mod p, right? Or raise each term in the sum to the power a, where a is a number between 1 and p minus 1. And I, I mean, it's, this is supposed to be true for all such things. So I compute, I, well, like the biggest experiment I did was with p was, I don't know, 104,000 or something. Computed all the numbers all the hundred and some thousand numbers, and looked at the biggest absolute value. But sadly, it, it was only three point something. So it's not going to tell me if, if it's really four or if it's really this thing I think. Um, and it took all night <laughs> to do it. OK, so let me just end now, because time is up. Um, right, there are other polynomials. If, if instead of x to the p minus 2, you took the x to p minus 1 coefficient, the thing would completely fail. This, this sum would really be basically of size p. So it's not just any old polynomial. Some polynomials are better than others. We don't understand why. Um, all right, a little more. OK, at the very end, let me just say, early in his life, before he proved Riemann hypothesis, Deline had proved that the Ve conjectures for projective smooth rise implied the Ramanujan conjecture, so in particular, it showed that, and I'll end with maybe the only, well, I guess there's an e to the i pi equals minus 1 on a stamp. And here's Ramanujan's statement on a stamp. 
Thank you. Are there questions for our speaker? Um, I have a question. So, just a historical question. When um, the Riemann hypothesis for curves was uh, proved, uh, I presume with the connection with the actual Riemann hypothesis was clearly understood or, or not? No, I mean, already when Artin formulates the Riemann hypothesis in 1923, it's, he understands that, he, that it's a, an analog of the... So that was already pretty clear. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's, it's, it's guided by that analogy. I mean, they, they, they completely had in their heads that the function field of a curve over a finite field was like a number field. And they wanted to... So the two say the functions had, had a similar behavior. Any question? Maybe some of the students are brave enough. Please feel free. This is your time to <laughs> ask questions. They're voting with their feet. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay, well, let's thank uh, Nick Katz again, and there's a reception outside. <laughs> <laughs>